Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, that's great. We're here another week, and Matt, Mm -hmm. I'm hesitant to say, and it pains me to say, another Mm -hmm. week, another year older, and Matt, Mm -hmm. birthdays when I was a kid, exciting time. Exciting, yes, yeah. Exciting time, there's presents, presents everywhere, Matt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Presents everywhere, and... You know, usually a fam jam equivalent and then also the friend jam equivalent, Matt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Used to live for those dual festivities. But now, mm-hmm. as a bitter old man who's, <laughs> once again, Matt, continuing mm-hmm. to lose the battle against father time, mm-hmm. birthdays don't hit as well as they do or as they did growing up. Mm-hmm, but I mm-hmm. mm-hmm. have to say, Matt. Mm-hmm. Come to you another year older, potentially not another year wiser, <laughs> but mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. I took advantage of my free birthday prezies from the various fast food chains or uh, restos in the vicinity, and Matt, mm-hmm. did I have a tummy ache oh, by man. the end of my birthday evening just because I was full of ice cream? Mm-hmm. Uh, the free scoop from Marble Slab. I got a free drink from the Alley, a bubble tea place, and also a free drink from Starbucks. I still have Ooh. my free Mr. Sub sub in the chamber. I still have my free Cha Time bubble tea in the chamber, <laughs> which I have. I should probably use tomorrow or whenever I remember to use it. Because Matt, mm-hmm. if I let that expire, you're gonna feel real bad. Oh, feel man. real bad, Matt. But Mm-hmm. Have to admit something to you, Matt. I got I let my anxiety get the best of me on my birthday. Okay, what happened, Jaron? So originally, this is going to go into TMI, you know, territory. <laughs> but uh-huh. uh, my mother likes to frequent uh, casinos, and Matt, uh-huh. my mom does adult gotcha while I still do <laughs> the destructive baby gotcha. Oh, Matt, mm-hmm. apple doesn't fall. <laughs> <laughs> too too far from the tree. But uh-huh. when doing adult gambling gotcha, you get various perks from the casinos you frequent because Matt, that's how they get you. Uh-huh, that, that's, uh-huh. that's, that's the casino spark system. That's the daily login bonus, yeah. Yes. So one of the perks my mother receives is free shows at their um, stage or their venue. And usually I've done this before where... My mom will log in, tell me a bunch of shows coming up, and say, hey, do you want to go to any of these shows? And Mm -hmm. Matt, Mm -hmm. uh, the two nights before, my mom told me a few of the shows coming up on the stage. And one of those shows, Matt, was, Matt, Mm -hmm. remember recording artist Flo Rida? Yeah, of course I remember recording artist Flo Rida. (laughs) You know, he had such jams such as Low. Mm-hmm. and my house mm-hmm. and Matt all that, whenever I think of Flo Rida I think of Lowe and Lowe's let's say Hall of Fame status in the world of street dancing if you know uh-huh. what I mean which uh-huh. you do know what I mean so Matt mm-hmm. my mother got us free tickets to Flo Rida at the casino okay now the show was on my birthday night and Matt mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I initially was excited because you know me, Matt. This is meme territory. Yeah. But let, let, let's do the checklist. Mm-hmm. Um, it's my birthday. Uh, checkmark. Mm-hmm. It's free. Checkmark. It's mm-hmm. Flowrider. Checkmark. Mm-hmm. Matt. Mm-hmm. Casino stage. Niagara Falls. Uh-huh. We'll, we'll, we'll put an X next to that. Okay. <laughs> Have to drive after work to get the tickets. Oh, put an right. X after that because, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's prime time. Um... Traffic. That's uh, prime time rush hour. Matt. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, now let's do a double underline on this is the Friday of the long weekend. Oh right, yes, yes, yeah. Oh man, so Jared. Matt, oh, <laughs> this <is> bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. As as much as it pain me, pains me to say, Matt. I 
had to get my mom to cancel those tickets because oh, man. did not want to drive to Niagara oh. and was getting a panic attack over it. Oh, man. Yeah, that would so have been Matt, a, I, a rough drive, Jaren. So I unfortunately did not see Flo Rider on my birthday. But oh, man. What I did spend, how I did spend my birthday, Matt, hmm. getting two sausages <laughs> and a poutine from Costco. Classic. Yo, Jaren, Jaren, that's... That's that's still a pretty good, uh, pretty good sounding birthday gift for yourself. I enjoyed myself, and needless to say, I think despite missing out on recording artist Flo Rida, mm-hmm. I think I saved myself the sanity of attempting to drive to Niagara Falls on the Friday of a long weekend. Mm-hmm. But Matt, mm-hmm. what else I did on my birthday? Uh, speaking about adult gambling for my mom's end, uh, I pulled some gotcha in Nike. Ooh, Goddess okay. of Victory. Mm-hmm. And I believe I'm at the day before that was the latest Ark Knights, you know, limited banner to come mm-hmm. to the game. Mm-hmm. So that two days of rolling for, you know, just units and gotcha games I play. Matt, mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but when I roll from gotcha, I I typically try not to buy into premium currency. So for me and all the games I play, it's I need to stockpile my free to play currency mm-hmm, or premium mm-hmm. currency mm-hmm. and go all out during limited units and anniversary events. Mm-hmm. And that there's something about when I roll, I tend to roll hard because Lady Luck sometimes isn't with me, Matt. And for Ark Knights, I saw all my premium currency vanish because I had Ooh. to spark. AKA do 300 rolls to be able to exchange my uh, banner tokens to buy their limited unit I wanted. Because Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe her name is Shu. She shared a banner with another six star. And Matt got like mm-hmm. four copies of the other six star Oof. that she shares the banner with. And then for Nike, had to, was trying to roll for uh, a PVP unit. Not necessarily a PVP unit, but a strong PVP unit, but... That took me, Matt, around another 200 rolls. And mm-hmm. I don't know about you, Matt, but every time I go all in on these rolls, I never feel good about myself. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels pretty bad. You spend all this time stockpiling your free-to-play currency, and in a blink of an eye, it's gone, and you yeah. have little to nothing to show for it. Because oh, man. Mm-hmm. it doesn't help that I follow the respective subreddits, discussion boards and when i matt i like torturing myself and i like going into the hey let's mm-hmm. share your polls discussion thread and <laughs> going through everyone's matt how come everyone else gets godly polls but me oh man yeah jared i i hate to go into those threads just because i know you know you you're like i don't know maybe like 150 50, yeah 150 pulls deep and you haven't gotten what you wanted, and then you go into that thread, and someone's like, "Oh, I got them on my one free, my first free pull, <laughs> my first free pull," <laughs> and they have to drop the F two P BT dub, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just as the cherry on top. Yeah. Matt. You know what, Jared? I think I would be even more angry if they were actually like <laughs> players who paid for for rolls, <laughs> if they got it on their first free roll. Matt mm-hmm. feels bad. Matt, gotcha. I never feel good playing gotcha, and oh man, it's also one of those things where I, I I hate how my brain's wired, Matt. Just because sometimes I'll miss a login bonus or I'll mm-hmm. miss a like claiming my weekly rewards, like I did with Ark Knights, which I badly need because Matt again have no <laughs> premium currency there, mm-hmm. and. That just puts me in such a sour mood when it comes to that game where it just makes me want to quit. And that, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe gotcha <laughs> games were the biggest mistake of the mistake zone. Yeah. And I, I should do a check-in with Matt. Mm-hmm. Bang Dream Girls Band Party for <laughs> the EN server. Again, on fire. Just because they were supposed to launch the MyGo. You know, MyGo, the mm-hmm, new mm-hmm. Bang Dream Band. To, or the... The newest Bang Dream band to come to the game, at least. And they were supposed to launch proper in North America. Matt, Mm -hmm. day before, uh, it was supposed to launch, I believe, July 30th. With a new event, new banner, and just a new band. 
And during this whole time, they have a login event of, hey, five days, get 50 free premium currency, Mm -hmm. aka after all five days, you get one free pull um, launch of MyGo. And that day before, Mm -hmm. Ian announces, hey, due to some technical difficulties, uh, the MyGo inclusion has been um, put on hold until further notice. And Mm -hmm. that... Mm -hmm pains me to say this but i'm not sure how much longer <laughs> en bang dream uh server will be around oh, no. but it's it, it's hard when you have a band that the community has been looking forward to so much just because matt mm-hmm. i mentioned it briefly but my go has been um you know pretty popular when it comes to you know both the anime world and the bang dream world among the fan base so mm-hmm. to see it being flubbed here in the worldwide server, you know, begs the question, how much more life does this server have? But mm-hmm. I digress because I'm still waiting for the Chainsaw Man um, <laughs> collab to come to Eon, which again, man, mm-hmm. these are why I'm saving my premium currency. So I can go all out, do my max amount of pulls and then exchange for a unit I'm never going to get. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I digress, Matt. Enough about me being sad about being old and gotcha pulls. Matt, mm-hmm. how have you been, my friend? Jaren, I've been good. I've been good, Jaren. Um, I mean, Jaren, I I went to Jaren. I went to the movie theaters by myself so I could go watch some Deadpool. Hey, Matt. Mm-hmm. I feel like, especially now that we're old men, mm-hmm. going to movies by yourself underrated. Mm-hmm. Jaren, it's, it's so good. Jaren, I think the only thing I regret about um going to that movie is that i didn't want to drive to the far theater that had the d-box seats fair fair enough matt (laughs) Matt, Mm -hmm. okay so you saw deadpool and wolverine yes (laughs) matt do you think this would make a good 4dx movie i mean jaren i think that there is enough like rocking around in that movie that it would be a good uh 4dx movie fair enough matt matt Mm-hmm. We we need to next time I'm in the area, next time I'm near the vicinity of the Saturday morning arcade clubhouse, need to see what's playing 4DX. Hopefully mm-hmm. it's anime adjacent. But... I mean Jaren, whenever Fast Eleven comes out, we're going for sure. Of course. Of mm-hmm. course. We have to, man. Mm-hmm. We're obligated. Jaren, does Fast Eleven but... have a release date? I couldn't tell you, man. Okay. I could I that's as much as I love the Fast and Furious movies, I don't mm-hmm. know. It's one of those things where I was going to assume it was supposed to come out this year, but I don't know, man. Oh, I, Jaren, know. I just looked it up. up. It is, first off, it's in 2026. Secondly, I didn't know it was Fast 10 Part 2. Jaren, I don't like that. <laughs> don't like that. Don't like that at all. You you have to go all in that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 2026 seems too far for me. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Jaren, it's going we... to go up against <laughs> Robert Downey Jr. But Matt, mm-hmm. I went on my, you know, another delusional rant last week <laughs> about Deadpool and Wolverine. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a few uh, friends had brought it up how I completely missed the meta narrative of the movie. <laughs> and that when you really think about, you know, the subtext behind it, how Wolverine and Deadpool is a meta narrative about... Deadpool's place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but also uh, Fox's place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Sony's place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And once you realize that, you get Mm -hmm. a new appreciation for the movie. And Matt, Mm -hmm. I say fair enough, but at the (laughs) same time, I still think this movie is heavily reliant on nostalgia baiting. But I digress. Oh, man. As -hmm. someone who just watched the movie... How did you feel about Deadpool and Wolverine? Jaren, I was thoroughly nostalgia baited. I you're you're very right about your um kind of call out last week on me that I would very much enjoy this movie. Because Jaren, I I enjoyed all the callbacks. I I got I think exactly what I wanted out of this movie in terms of uh, you know, everything showing up. Jaren, I I kind of agree that the plot is just 
It is not even a real consideration, I think. So now before you continue, let, let's just put this out there. We're going to talk about some deep spoilers, some spoilers about um, Deadpool and Wolverine. And that, let's mm-hmm. be honest, mm-hmm. I feel like a week after, now I'm looking at official images being released from the movie of all the different, not even cameos, but side characters at this mm-hmm. point, mm-hmm. where I, I think we're free just to talk about it. So I have to ask you, man. Yes. So you you know you said movie paper thin, mm-hmm. where I guess, I guess let's just get into it the the fun parts at least Matt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You said you wanted this to happen, and I had to bite my tongue, so I have to ask <laughs> Matt. Uh huh. Chris Evans. Oh man. How did you feel? <laughs> Jared, I was so happy when he showed up. I was like, oh yes, yes. He's it's good that he's he's young in this, so he's definitely not gonna be Captain America. Oh man, Jaren, I I only wish that he was human torch for longer. Fair enough. Not, not. Mm-hmm. The the meta joke, of course, he was tanking the budget, which mm-hmm. Jaren, I was I surprised think... to see Pyro there. I didn't yes. think that I would ever see his character again. So in terms of all the side characters and all the appearances, I guess we'll just go to the main ones right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, how did you feel with the reveal of, you know, Elektra, Blade, and uh, Channing Tatum's Gambit? I was so surprised to see uh, Elektra and Blade in there. Mm-hmm. Jaren, when, <laughs> when Channing Tatum showed up, I doubted myself so much because i was like wait was did he really play gambit in an x-men movie and i just was totally unaware of this it jaron he didn't play gambit in any x-men movies did he no he was apparently okay. pen to play it and okay. then you know things just didn't work out hence the line of you know whatever he said where it was it feels like i was born in the void mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. okay good I, I was, like, really doubting myself. Jaren, I think he played Gambit very, very well. I never... Okay, Jaren, it's been... Like, like I, I, am, I am well over 30 years old, Jaren. Yes. And I've been watching, you know, X-Men since, like, when it was, like, the cartoon in the 90s. And until this movie, I never realized why Gambit was called Gambit until, until Channing Tatum called himself, like, the gambit and i made the, finally made that connection and i feel like an idiot for for all this time when i didn't understand that name hey matt revelations get us all mm-hmm. but yeah i i think that scene in particular was the it was the fanboy moment it was the hey we're gonna do callbacks and i'm on one hand i'm really glad that at least for me none mm. of these really leaked you know, mm-hmm, I was pleasantly mm-hmm. surprised when, you know, Jennifer Garner came out, Wesley Snipes yeah. came out. And like you, Matt, it w- Channing Tatum's appearance was one of those, wait, I had to dial itself back where w- he, was he penned to play Gambit at some point? And I just assumed that was the whole point. And even then, mm-hmm. you had all these different, you know, little callbacks, like, the one that I always see throwing around was when they were asking, oh, where's Daredevil? And, you know, them mm-hmm. real revealing, oh, he died, apologizing <laughs> to Elektra and she not really caring. Uh, good point part there. You know, a lot of back and forth between Blade and Deadpool kind of alluding to the apparent or the supposed you know, issues Ryan Reynolds and Wesley Snipes had with each other back in the filming of the original Blade trilogy. So just all these little things. But again, Mm -hmm. it was that pessimistic part of me when this was happening of, oh, this is the Tony Maguire, Andrew Garfield moment of the movie. where Of course, everyone's popping here. And me being the grouchy old man going, oh, of course, they're doing this. But I, again, as a fan of the more just comic book movies growing up, just seeing them all together, and as much as I was poo pooing it, it is nice to have them have one last hurrah in terms of you know that Electra, that Blade, and you know Channing Tatum finally getting to play his Gambit as well, mm-hmm. where it was a good feel good 
moment uh kind of coupled with me being a bitter old man but that mm-hmm. rewinding it back so we had deadpool going to the tva and that what did you think of the twist where i think the assumption going into the movie was the reason why deadpool is with the tv or is being scouted out by the TVA was because of the ending of Deadpool 2, him playing around with Cable's time machine, um, Mm -hmm. just running amok. And you would think that that would be the central plot point. Uh, How did you feel about Mr. Paradox going, no, we don't really care about that. Let's talk about the, you know, the core person or the chosen person and having that being essentially the pushing plot point of Deadpool and Wolverine. I mean, Jaren... Like I said earlier, and I think like you said last week, Jaren, <laughs> the plot doesn't really matter here, Jaren. Like, it's a vehicle to see Deadpool and friends, mm-hmm. right? It's a vehicle to see Deadpool and friends, and I think for for what it was what it's worth, it 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 got us to a bunch of like very fun uh Wolverine searching moments. So I have to ask you, Matt, since mm-hmm. I think between the two of us, you might have more affinity for the X-Men. Uh, movies than I do, but Hugh Jackman's portrayal of Wolverine in this movie. How, how did you feel about his Wolverine? I mean, I thought it was like perfectly fine. Like, I, I, mm-hmm. I like the yellow suit. The yellow suit actually, I think I was one of those people who thought the yellow suit would look kind of like ridiculous in live action. Yeah. But I think I really liked the design that they like ended up using for the uh, the yellow suit in this uh, in this movie. Have to ask, how, how did you feel about? him finally donning the wolverine mask with the yellow suit that was a that was a good goof i i like i thought the mask looked a lot better than i thought it was going to it was Mm -hmm. very you know appropriate for when they decided to do it and now i kind of want to i i'm well i don't want to go back to the theaters here but like whenever it comes out on um you know like streaming i want to scrub through the movie to see if like it's viewable on that's fair yeah. yeah, like as a hood, like throughout the movie. Not one part about the movie that really threw me off, and I'm, I wasn't really understanding because Matt, hmm. of course, I'm old and dumb. How did you feel about Deadpool's venture off into the multiverse to find a new Wolverine and us seeing all these different Wolverine incarnations? I mean, I thought they were all like pretty good goofs. Like, mm-hmm. Jaren, I I know for sure there was like a couple. I can't rem- like really remember what they were, but like there was a couple I just didn't understand. Yeah, because I I think it's just I didn't recognize either who was playing them or whatever. Yes, or the but, context of the from the comic universe is what mm-hmm, you were looking yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, like I, there was like some yeah. that I didn't understand, but like for the most part, I thought like they were very good. I I like their you know photoshopping or yeah, like I guess technically like after effectsing of a uh, short Hugh Jackman. That's a good goof. Yeah, good goof. Now, mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. in terms of the villain we you know you have mr paradox to a degree but have to ask you how are your thoughts on uh cassandra nova as the big bad jared i i like the way that she was portrayed i don't know literally anything about this character i don't even know if she's a real character yes. or like is she because i i don't think i've ever like seen her before so she is a real character in marvel comics but it's one of those instances where her actual backstory, you know, being the twin of, um, you know, Professor Xavier, mm-hmm. how he sensed that she was purely evil. So he kills her in the womb and she essentially is <laughs> kind of a bunch of cells who form on the walls of the sewer to become herself with a ploy to kill her twin brother oh <laughs> where her actual backstory is one of those it only works in the deadpool i guess a deadpool film or a deadpool kind of framing narrative because her actual backstory is so just insane that it, it wouldn't necessarily play in any semi-serious Marvel movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where she fits right home here, even though from what we get to hear, it isn't as crazy as it does get from the comics. But yeah, I really loved her portrayal in the movie, Matt. Mm-hmm. I loved how the presented, how she reads or goes through people's minds and her oh, essentially yes. just 
putting her fingers through their faces where men mm-hmm. mm-hmm. for a movie that starts off pretty gory with Deadpool fighting those TVA agents mm-hmm. uh, and essentially, you know, doing what he did to old man Logan's uh, corpse. Uh-huh. I think Cassie reading people's minds is the most disgusting thing in the movie. Yeah. They really like played with that well. And like, I feel like the scenes where she was reading someone's mind, they extended it for as long as they could. Yes. Instead of just doing it as like, you know, a quick like oh hand through the head sort of thing. There was that one shot when she does it to uh, Paradox and mm-hmm. so her hands like partially through his face and then she kind of grabs it and then mm-hmm. like, you know, clenches her palm and then starts dragging him towards whatever yes, time bomb yes, they're going yes, yes. to and that mm-hmm. physically winced at that part <laughs> i think i don't know i loved how cassandra was played mm-hmm. um so matt i gotta ask mm-hmm. how did you feel about the ending to fallout 3 in deadpool and wolverine <laughs> oh man that was uh jaren i they just needed to you know actually you know what deadpool and wolverine are i guess sort of technically a super mutant Yes. So, you know, <laughs> ending makes sense. Ending makes it sense. It uh, what do you call it? Hugh Jackman still, still, still jacked, man. That, mm-hmm. that had to be, so, there had to be some <laughs> CG going on there, right? I don't, okay, honestly, Jaren, it basically being his job to be like, you know, ripped and you know, this probably maybe being like, <laughs> probably his last Wolverine movie and yeah. them like, you know, goofing on, on it for the whole movie. I think, there's a chance that you know maybe he he went hard for a while just for this but Fair. i i wouldn't be surprised if it was a cg matt mm-hmm. as we say countless times on the mistake zone father time losing battle but so- some people mm-hmm. are able <laughs> to put up better fights than others mm-hmm. 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 so uh final i guess because final thoughts in the movie matt what did you think of the the multiple deadpool variants throughout the movie and especially uh the Hall, the quote unquote hallway uh, shot at, towards the end. I really like the hallway shot towards the end. I wish I knew more about like alternate Deadpools to be able to like yeah. call out more. I think they already like kind of like used the joke in the earlier movies, but I was surprised to not also see the um that like you know the the mouth melted over version of the Ryan Reynolds Deadpool from like right, the early yeah. uh, X Men movies. Yeah, I was surprised to not see that one. At the end, I I honestly thought that would have been the like leader Deadpool, mm-hmm. but other than that, like I I enjoyed it. I understand why a lot of the Deadpools kind of just looked like Deadpool, but and I wouldn't I don't think I would have gotten any more <laughs> out of uh, them if they did use a bunch of alternate versions of Deadpool. But fair the the scene itself was very very good. Okay, mm-hmm. and I guess Matt. Mm-hmm. So we had a we don't necessarily have a mid credit scene, but we do have essentially a farewell montage to the Fox oh, universe. <laughs> and again, Matt, as someone with more affinity to those movies, how did you feel about, I guess, the quote unquote mid credits scene or just the send off? I mean, I enjoyed it. It was a good it was a good uh kind of like credits scene, Jaren, the the music choice, Jaren, throughout this whole movie, the music choices, I think, were all very, very on point in terms of nostalgia rating. Matt, what did you think of the the NSYNC choreo- choreography in the beginning? I enjoyed it, Jaren. I think of all the, um, I guess, like, quote-unquote musical numbers throughout the movie, yeah. I think that was the weakest one for me. Yeah, agreed. Mm-hmm. I understood what they were going for, but Matt, I'll, I'll be honest, I, mm-hmm. I feel like that was the part where... I was a bit embarrassed, secondhand embarrassment where I, I feel like the bye 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 stuff went on a bit too long for my liking and it was a too much dancing for my liking. And you know me, Matt, I love me some mm-hmm. dancing, but Jordan, I wouldn't have minded dancing so much if it was incorporated into the fight instead of like a cutaway. Yeah. I think that enough. would have made it like hit a lot better for me. No, that's a fair point. And yeah, it was the cutaway portion that really was jarring and Mm -hmm. yeah i I agree if it was incorporated a bit better i think i would have enjoyed it a lot more as well and that we have Mm -hmm. our after credit scene uh chris evans makes another appearance as uh the human torch and matt what did you think of the after credit scene 
that was a good scene. I, I honestly, Jaren, I was just genuinely surprised that uh, Johnny Storm was actually talking that much shit. Yeah, it it, it was fun, Matt. It was fun. Mm-hmm. Where I guess before I go into kind of the ramifications over uh, for the MCU post Deadpool and Wolverine, uh, just closing thoughts on the movie, Matt. I think you kind of like said everything that needed to be said last week, Jaren. It is a, or I like, yeah, I think it's like a very fun nostalgia piece. I think the plot is there just to be there. Mm-hmm. I do. I am looking forward to watching it again when it like is, is released digitally. I, I wonder how Deadpool four is going to play if they hit a Deadpool four. Right. Yeah. I want to, I want to know like how they're going to, if they're going to try to like hit this exact same amount of nostalgia and what nostalgia they'll hit. Where that that's what I wanted to ask you before we left this conversation, Matt. Where so again, going back to last week, we have this new wave of Marvel um heroes coming out. You know, we have the Thunderbolts, we have the Fantastic Four, and this will all accumulate into the Avengers Doomsday and the Avengers Secret Wars. Plus, you know, now that mutants have been introduced, we're gonna we're bound to see X-Men sooner or later. Mm-hmm. And I I have to ask, Matt, Matt, in terms of Deadpool's place in the MCU, because, again, this isn't Deadpool. He's in his own universe. This isn't the sacred timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you see him popping up in kind of the Avengers or even after credit scenes moving forward? And do you think just the nature of Deadpool, of how meta his character is, that... Deadpool could could he actually potentially work in a Avengers movie? I honestly do not see Deadpool showing up in like the main mainline MCU movies. Mm-hmm. I see him like far more like a focus of an episode of a movie or a, of a uh, like a TV show or you know kind of showing up in the backgrounds of like these uh these movies but i like i cannot see them incorporating deadpool into like dooms like doomsday or something yeah um as like a a major part of the plot like nothing more than a throwaway i think where just because again it's such a different vibe compared to what the MCU is trying to set up and even when you have the more wittier characters something like a guardians uh even like the first ant-man that is a bit more lighter in terms of tone mm-hmm. it's it's still within that i at least for me personally that serious nature where everything comes together where yeah. i think the hope that everyone does have is, again it is that notion of, okay, now that we have the Sony verse in the fold, the Fox verse in the fold, and this all accumulates with secret wars, mm-hmm. it's going, again, my fear with secret wars, which I, I think I said last week is, okay, hopefully the Russo brothers are able to, you know, present a really comparing compelling narrative but i'm also scared that this will just boil down to okay let's throw in a bunch of sony characters let's throw in a bunch of fox characters oh let's throw in these netflix characters let's you know get the defenders back in here Mm -hmm. and i don't know if we're reaching that point of who else can you really grab to have that you know, the Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield moment, the Jennifer Garner, Wesley Snipes moment, where Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that now that we're past this hump, it's a bit more contained. But at the same time, since Deadpool relies so heavily on, you know, breaking that fourth wall, my, while there's probably too much money on the table for him not to be involved, I think the extent of Deadpool moving forward, especially for Secret Wars, is, I don't know, post credit scene or something. But even yeah. then, you have to be kind of careful with that, depending on how serious the narrative you're trying to present is. But that, that's kind of me. But mm-hmm. again, man, I had fun. Um, it was nice seeing those characters all interact. Again, I popped out of my seat, but I'm also a pessimistic old man at the end of the day. Uh, Matt? Mm-hmm. 
have to ask you, did you get any of the special cups or popcorn buckets when you went? I did not. I did not even know they had them. I tried to get one of the cups, but they're all sold out when we went, Matt. Yeah. But uh, that's the wrap up on Deadpool and Wolverine. Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about, you know, how grimy the at least the beginning of Deadpool and Wolverine was mm-hmm. and how how really gnarly Cassandra Nova was with her mind reading. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I have two games that I wanted to kind of briefly talk about okay. this week. And mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. the first one is a game called Motor Doom. Where okay. This came out this week. I believe the launch price is around $16 Canadian. And I've been playing the demo more than I thought I would be playing. And okay. It was me debating of, oh, should I just pull the trigger on the full version? And Matt, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm heavily debating pulling the trigger on this because Motor Doom is... Matt, remember when I talked about Hellscape a few weeks or a few months ago? Yes. Which is a a rogue light mixed with a essentially Tony Hawk's pro skater game. Mm-hmm. And Motor Doom is essentially that where... At its core, you have a game that is heavily inspired by the PlayStation 1 era of... Essentially, the Activision O2 era of the Tony Hawk extreme sports genre, where the demo itself even starts you off in its warehouse equivalent. And, Uh you know, it plays like you would think one of these games. Not only does it look like a PS1 era of... Uh, these extreme sports game, but it kind of plays the same way where you're holding down, you know, X or your A button to prep up your jump. You're using uh, the square button for a flip trick uh, equivalent. You're using the triangle to grind. Uh, Mm -hmm. You're pressing up and down to manual. And Mm -hmm. it feels a lot tighter than I thought Hellscape initially felt. And... Mm -hmm. But similar to Hellscape, Matt, this is also a roguelite at its core, more adjacent to the vampire survivor um, style of roguelite, where oh, okay. with Motor Doom, this is essentially Tony Hawk meets a horde, uh, just a horde run where you can, I believe there are a few different modes. One is 50 rounds unlimited, and you're kind of going about these the the initial warehouse level is pretty self-contained but from the videos that i've seen the other mm-hmm. levels you get to unlock are a bit more open in scope but at its again man at its core you're collecting you're doing tricks um to fill up your experience bar because the more tricks you do the higher your combos and when mm-hmm. you land and bank that score that contributes to your 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 leveling mechanics and there you're able to you know pick different power-ups where hey i want essentially flames to come out of my so you're riding it's not a skateboarding game but you're on a motocross bike sometimes Mm -hmm. you have a motorcycle with a side cart in it and then you depending on the character you have you have a different um motorized bike but yeah essentially you get different power-ups and you actually are able to shoot with R1. And it essentially kind of shoots in front of you or auto-locks to the nearest enemy. And Mm -hmm. if you hold L1, you will go into a brief slow motion that lets you do more finer targeting. Mm -hmm. And as well, you can also set it to auto-shoot to any enemies in front of you with a, you know, a bit of a penalty when it comes to your overall score. So... At its core, that's what Motor Doom is. It is a Vampire Survivor's Light mixed with a Tony Hawk game. And that I think it works pretty well together. Where mm-hmm. something like a Hellscape is more so, I would say, more comparable to, say, a Tony Hawk's Underground, where you're kind of skating around these bigger areas and you're trying to do all of these different missions where with something like a motor doom you're just going around doing tricks doing combos in order for you to kill more enemies and make it to the final wave and to have something more condensed that way i think fits the feel of 
that arcade extreme sports gameplay a lot better mm-hmm. than trying to do more nuanced co- uh, mission challenges into hellscape i i know i'm kind of unfairly comparing the two but it, it's hard not to when you have something that is really going for that classic Tony Hawk gameplay mixed with roguelite elements. And of yeah. course with Motor Doom, you have your meta progression where there are currencies that you can pick up and then you can use that to buy, I believe, more characters, but even more attachments to your bike where, hey, I want to put like a chainsaw in front of my bike as well, <laughs> where I think it does feel good. And this definitely seems like something that I can see my, it can be a great before bed um game you know similar to how vampire survivors was where let's try another round see how far uh, we can get and i don't know it just i i do like the playstation one uh inspired aesthetic looks gnarly some of the enemies look not they look pretty of the time so Uh that that's also uh something where uh i think my only gripe so far is some of the characters that I've seen, you know, you you have your basic dude in a motorcycle uh, helmet on a motorbike. You have a jester. You have skeletons in a motorcycle and side cart. So it has that, you know, grimy, heavy metal inspired aesthetic. Uh, but I, w- I was kind of hoping for more just variety when it comes to characters. But other than that, mm. gameplay from the demo. Do the characters make a difference, Jared? Uh, in the demo, I only use the motorcycle guy. So I, see. I think if I do pick this up, I'll just uh, talk about it in future episodes. It would just be how different the characters are. But mm-hmm. the demo itself, really fun. One of the Steam reviews, uh, you know, when they reviewed it, they only had a hour of playtime, but said in the review, oh, I had 44 hours in the demo. So mm-hmm. if this mm-hmm. is up your wheelhouse, this is definitely something to check out and probably something I'll end up purchasing uh, relatively soon. I mean, Jared, so I'm looking at gameplay of Motor Doom. Yeah. And I do definitely see the kind of like, you know, early Tony Hawk aesthetic here. But one thing that is actually like really kind of tripping me out, I guess, or like kind of sticking out to me. How is like the kind of like flow in this game when you're getting power ups? Because it, right. it looks like it's kind of just like, you know, popping these like cards that you can pick your, your power up from. Does that like kind of get like take away from I guess like the the feeling of the game? Because it looks like it does like put a quick stop on the game where you know you it feels like it would I don't know in my head interrupt I guess like the the skating flow of the game. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up just because in terms of discussion, that's also something that a lot of people are also mentioning. Where mm-hmm. one of the kind of negatives is the roguelite aspect of selecting your power up selecting your buff to in order to become more powerful and select more buffs but yeah so essentially when you you reach your xp threshold um the game just stops you it brings up a menu and you're given a choice of three different cards and those are your power ups mm-hmm. where definitely with the tony hawk games in particular it's all about that flow where even with I think I mentioned when we talked about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, one of my, you know, not biggest gripes, but gripes of the game is just how long it kind of takes to restart a round. And mm-hmm. in terms of Motor Doom, I immediately, when in the beginning, I kind of appreciated how, okay, you bank your score, you get a selection of three cards, and it kind of gives you time to get your bearings, think about how you want to progress but i think w- once you have a hand with the or you get a better hold of the gameplay you're better with the combos uh you're definitely better with the shooting aspect especially if you pick manual um for you to bank a score and then immediately get put into a selection can definitely break the flow uh and just your overall groove which is so important to a game like a tony hawk mm-hmm. like and what I assume to Motor Doom, where I think the turnaround, what people have been mentioning discussion wise is turn on the setting that similar to Vampire uh, Survivors just auto picks up power up for you. Ah, I see. And I think 
if you're not trying to tailor your run, that definitely works. Mm-hmm. Where, again, maybe this is something that I want to confirm once I play the full game, just because it, I only have like uh, two hours or so with the demo. Uh-huh. Um, it is, if you were to put a auto select, how much would that really influence your run for the better or for the worse? Because there are some power-ups that are like, oh, uh, make your reload faster at a 10% um, decrease to your overall attack. And then, of course, each time you select a card, there are different levels to it. So maybe you'll get uh, powerful versions down the road. But Matt, whenever I see a decrease to damage done, I mm-hmm. I kind of avoid it. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, that's definitely something I'll keep an eye out. But yeah, definitely something I'm glad you you're, you brought up, Matt, just because selecting a power-up in that way, in a flow, in a gameplay that is so reliant on you feeling the groove can get, you know, a bit annoying. But mm-hmm. hopefully that is something you can address when you do auto-select. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about the grimy world of Motor Doom, there's also one game that... I have had on the back burner in terms of when should I talk about this game. (laughs) Uh And Matt, Uh this game came out when you were in Japan. And I'm talking about Buckshot Roulette, Mm -hmm. which is, Matt, I think, got a lot of attention just online just because it has such a grimy aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I think even price-wise, it is less than $4 regular price. Uh, at four dollars Canadian, mm-hmm. but Matt, mm-hmm. what box shot roulette is is think about the first part of inscription and just that general aesthetic, that general vibe of you taking on a dealer, mm-hmm. and you essentially have the, I guess the visual. Um, touch point of Buckshot Roulette to the point where, Matt, Mm -hmm. if you go to the Buckshot Roulette store on Steam, it's part of a bundle called Literally the Same Bundle, or Literally the Same Game Bundle, (laughs) which you can buy it, and Inscription for $20 Canadian. Nice, nice, nice. But Buckshot Roulette is a game where you fight a dealer, and in between you is a shotgun, and the whole point of the game is for you to play roulette with this dealer. Mm-hmm. At the start of each round, you'll have it will show you the amount of shells that are blanks and that are actually loaded. It gets shuffled into the shotgun at random, and you have to essentially pick: Do you want to shoot the dealer or do you want to shoot yourself? If you shoot yourself with a blank, um, it skips the d. De- dealers next term and vice versa so that's kind of the general gameplay loop of buckshot roulette Mm -hmm. this is a roulette a russian roulette style game where it gets more technical is the fact that there are different power-ups that you can get uh that can influence your run in essentially the vanilla uh your vanilla run of buckshot roulette you you only have access to a few weapons or items at random for example there is a handcuff item that will let you handcuff uh the dealer and vice versa yourself that skips their next uh two turns or you can get a magnifying glass that lets you look to see which is the next bullet is it going to be a blank is it going to be um loaded so it's all these different tools that let you kind of tilt the game to your favor if you know how to use it because Mm -hmm. Matt there are no visual cues you don't have um a HUD or a UI element that says this is how many shots are left this is how many blanks are left this is how much live rounds are Mm -hmm. left and it's all about you knowing what may or may not be coming next and planning your turn accordingly and again matt it gets just so weird you have this blaring edm in the background you have this grimy dealer that looks terrifying and at the end of the round when you finally get to the point of okay next shot's going to kill all there's this big cinematic not big cinematic but the life support systems the kind of lifelines get cut signifying that okay this is the this is it this is the last run so that's Mm -hmm. essentially what buckshot roulette is it is such a 
it, it's a vibe, Matt. Mm-hmm. Where at an entry point of less than four dollars Canadian, even if you only play it for an hour or two, I feel like you'll get what you want out of it. And then once you clear the initial run, you kind of unlock the double or nothing mode where your goal is to reach, I believe it's like $17 million, AKA you doing 11 to 15 runs in a row successfully uh, for achievement purposes. And Mm -hmm. then with double or nothing, more items are introduced to the rotation. And while there isn't multiplayer right now, I believe that's something the dev- I believe is a solo developer as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, something they're looking into as well. But yeah, Matt, price point uh, under five dollars. If you're looking for, again, Matt, this is a vibes game, and if you're looking for just a quick run based game that there isn't necessarily a meta progression, something that you're used to from a roguelite, or there isn't different modifiers that you'll you'll unlock similar to like a Bellatro, but it is a test of really knowing what's in front of you and playing the odds that are given. So if that sounds like something you're into, I, I think I, I do recommend Buckshot Roulette now, just based on aesthetics alone, uh, fair price point. And again, mm-hmm. if you're only playing a round or two, I feel like you'll definitely get your money's worth of it. Mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. you can just sit in the lobby listening to the blaring uh, tech now and get an achievement for doing oh, that. Nice. So once you listen long enough. So yeah, that's Buckshot Roulette. Uh, check it out. But Matt, mm-hmm. let's just say it does get pretty hard where even uh, you can't save scum, the double or nothing runs as well. Matt, so that that really put a damper on me <laughs> trying to get the all the achievements in this game. But mm-hmm. those are the two grimy games on my mind this week. Matt, mm-hmm. uh, anything else that you were checking out this week other than Deadpool and Wolverine? I mean, Jaren, I guess I also have two uh, not grimy games on my mind. I think they, they actually are pretty uh, clean looking games. Okay. Okay. So, Matt, mm-hmm. we got we to gotta install the clean skin mod to mm-hmm. t- take out our uh, dirty NPC skins mm-hmm. from uh, our Bethesda game. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Matt, w- what cleaner games have you been checking out? So Jaren, I haven't been playing this one, but uh, you linked me earlier in the day that there are new Monster Hunter Wilds previews coming out uh, yes. this week. And they are going to be coming out for the rest of this week until Gamescom, uh, which is on August 21st. But Jaren, today they, or maybe it was like earlier, late yesterday, but they dropped uh, three videos for Monster Hunter Wilds that go over the uh, Great Sword, the basic mechanics, and the new focus mode. And Jaren, Great Sword, looking like a big old cloud style like sword. You know, it it looks how it did in the previous games. I'm sure there's some details. That I've changed, but I was never really a great sword uh, player outside of uh, Monster Hunter Go. Fair enough, fair enough. But I feel like that's not really you know a good place to to base uh, yeah. how this game uh, looks to me. But okay, Jaren, I guess like going more so towards the uh, other two videos that they drop the the basic mechanics overview. Jaren, game is looking fun. Jaren, you, I was. You know, it, I it kind of dawned on me in this video that they replaced your mount. From um, the Monster Hunter Rise game. Because in this game, you're riding the... I think it's supposed to be read like Secret. Like S-E-I-K-R-E-T. I I feel like it can be be read Secret or like Sacred or something like that. Fair. But But let's just say Secret for mm -hmm, now. mm -hmm. It's replacing the Palamut, which I'm surprised. Because I thought, you know, people would have been like still very good. Or like very like cool with riding around on on a dog. So it's surprising to see that they replace it with like you know a chocobo like uh like bird. But Matt, mm-hmm. so the dog was in Rise, correct? Yes, the dog was in Rise. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is Rise considered mainline Monster Hunter or spinoff Monster Hunter? And do you think that's why that informs the decision to switch to not ch- uh, chocobos? And I, I know I say chocobo <laughs> really weird. Uh, I yeah, Rise is not considered to be a mainline monster hunter game 
I guess mm-hmm. that could be why they uh, decided to go with a different uh, mount monster in this game. But, you know, it, it looks interesting. It is, you know, still functioning like a mount uh, that you would expect. It is introducing something interesting to me. I'm not sure if I'm just kind of like interpreting it wrong, but one of the things they said that your, you know, your new bird pal can do is that it can automatically guide you to the target monster. And that huh. is surprising to me when I read that, like the way I, that I'm interpreting it, in that you get on this bird and then it auto paths you to the monster, is how I interpreted that. And if it is that way, I'm actually very, very surprised because I, I wouldn't have thought that they would ever do something like that in a Monster Hunter game. Because I feel like the, like not only the, the automation part of it, but the fact that usually in Monster Hunter games you are, you know, doing as much uh, pre-fight prep as you can. And I almost feel like this is making it so you don't do the pre-fight prep. So I'm interested in seeing like if I'm just, you know, understanding that ability wrong or not. If that's the case that you're limiting, I guess, pre-fight prep. Now, again, as someone who with very minimum, aka not at all Monster Hunter knowledge, do you think that the fact that you're able to go on your uh, not Chocobo and get essentially taxi to the monster do you think that puts more em- or would put more emphasis into kind of your hub preparation or do you think that this might ultimately change up how the pre-fight is played out i think it does put a lot more prep on your hub uh preparation i think one thing that i think this like really if it is a legitimate um taxi to the monster it is probably going to get rid of the in world or make the in-world buffs may be less um, important than they were mm-hmm. in, uh, I guess, like Rise. Um, and I also wonder how this is going to affect, what do you call it? Kind of like world, you're like knowing your own place in the world. Because I feel like one of the things I really enjoyed in, you know, world and in Rise is the kind of sense of knowing, oh, okay, like the we've just like finished a fight with the monster and the monster has disengaged and it's going to like so and so area. I can take a couple paths there, but I know like if I take this path, it's pretty good for me because I can restock on like, you know, making more potions, make making right, um right. you know, like just important items that would help me towards the fight. And I wonder how much having an auto taxi will take away from um getting that that world knowledge. Okay, Matt, uh, what other videos did they release and did it speak more to the major changes that we'll see out of this next installment? Um, Yeah, the other video is the introduction of focus mode, which is actually a very wild change for me to see. Because like in essence, the I think less major thing is that it kind of gives you almost something like detective vision. From from Batman, where it'll like right. highlight weak points on the monsters that you're fighting, um, hmm. and additionally, when you hit a monster repeatedly in a certain part or like location, that location um, like breaks and then become or uh, becomes wounded and then becomes a new weak spot, which is something that's like sort of already existed in previous Monster Hunter games, but like now it's just you know a lot easier to see where they are, which I think is really helpful because. Jared, this is a very pretty game. Um, this is more in line with the realistic style that World had rather than the, I guess, like a bit more simplified cartoony style that Rise had. So being able to just have something that highlights uh, broken parts or like, you know, important parts on the monster is uh, very yeah. interesting. They introduced in this video focus strikes, with their, which are basically just like new kind of like attacks that do bonus damage to wounds and weak spots. But the thing that really, really stood out is the kind of like focus mode itself on what it does when you're fighting, which is that it gives you a reticle and the reticle is now controlling where you attack and where you block. Oh, right. Okay. And these are two very interesting changes to me. 
because first off, the the very, very big thing that I noticed is that you can now... So in previous games, when you charged an attack, you are basically locked into the direction that you charged the or started charging the attack in. So, you know, if like the monster was like in front of you and you started charging the attack and then it backflipped behind, like to go over you, you are no longer going to be able to hit the monster with that attack because it's just going to attack forward. The fact that uh, focus mode now lets you kind of spin in place to re-aim that attack is a huge, huge quality of life and potentially like a skill ceiling lowering kind of change that I'm very surprised to see. With something that gives you essentially more control, do you think monster attack patterns in turn will become more complex as a result? I I, I do because of the kind of like secondary change that focus mode uh, brings in, which is that you are now able to um, kind of like aim your block um, mm. because before like you really you know face the monster and you block and like that's fine if they come at you from the side you still ha- are able to like kind of block the attack but once it, you know of course once they come at you from behind you're going to get hit by the attack the ability for you to aim your block is now very interesting to me with this kind of like focus mode change because like, like I said, you can now re-aim, like, you know, charge attacks with focus mode. But another very interesting thing is that um, they kind of showed this off more in on, like, the focus mode video with the dual blades, where you can now kind of strafe your attacks around the monster. Like, you can, like, you know, swing while you're looking at the monster and be taking side steps and still be hitting the monster with your attack. So I'm thinking that direction is going to be a lot more important in Monster Hunter Wilds because... If you can aim your block, I think that they are going to start introducing attacks where your block really, really matters. Right. And I'm interested in seeing if, like, you know, it's going to be... I'm sure there's going to be someone's like, oh, you know, you're going to have a rock that's going to be rolling from the left, a rock, th- and then that's followed by a rock rolling from the right. And I'm interested in seeing, like, you know, that play out in a fight. Um, I'm sure, like, you know, the even harder monsters are going to be having, you know, attacks flying from every direction that you now have to, like, focus mode block. Almost like a, I don't know, almost like, like I think, like, a rhythm game type thing. And I think, secondly, I kind of mo- also wonder how it's going to feel with blocking on a mouse. Because, mm. you know, like, with the control stick, you, you jam it in as far as you, like, can in a direction, and then it stops. And... Generally, going from the middle or resting position to, like, you know, the left side of your left limit of your control stick pad is, like, almost instantaneous, I think. Whereas, kind of dragging a mouse left and right, you can impart your own level of speediness to it. And I wonder if um, that is going to be affected by your kind of, like, weapon having a max turn speed or something. That sounds, Matt, that sounds like a really big change as someone, again, as an outsider looking in, but mm-hmm, Matt, mm-hmm. also, I know you said that this might also help lower the skill, uh, skill ceiling, but Matt, mm-hmm. I'm just picturing a lot more intricate gameplay videos coming uh-huh, from this, uh-huh. which will also potentially lower it, but also raise it mm-hmm. notably as well. Yeah, I think it's lowering the kind of like attack skill ceiling, but it's probably definitely going to raise the defending skill ceiling. Okay. Uh, anything else of note coming from these videos, Matt? Uh, uh, not really anything else. Like, I think I'm interested in seeing what they're going to be putting out because, like, they have said that it's going to be a new weapon video, like, every day until, yeah, like I said, Gamescom. And I'm interested in seeing um, if there's going to be any more. Like changes to the the weapons, I more recognize because uh, fair. I'm sure that there are a lot of subtle differences within the Great Sword uh, video that a lot of Great Sword users are probably freaking out about. Matt, what weapon are you most excited to see, uh, video wise? Jaren, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, my boy the light bow gun, my you know just the normal bow weapon, the hunting horn, and the insect glaive. Those are those are the ones I tend to uh, play around with the most. All right. 
Fair enough, Matt. So mm-hmm. I guess we'll see you next week when we check in to see if your uh, if anything was shown off and how much more we've seen from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of the video so far, last question, Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, did it give any indication of any new monsters, returning monsters? How are the things that are being hunted uh, looking right now? They haven't shown any um, new, new monsters like that. Like, there are some new, like, you know, Monster Hunter Wilds monsters, but, like, they were all shown in kind of, like, the debut trailer. Uh, okay. There hasn't really been anything new. I think the newest thing that, like, I didn't even notice someone in the comments pointed out is that there's a monster that you fight now who slobbers all over the place. And one of the things that, like, you could do in previous games, but it was limited to being on a slope is slide around. And it seems like you can now do sliding attacks when this monster attacks you because it covers the floor and, like, basically drool. Which, one, kind of gross, but two, really cool that they made that into, like, a mechanic for fighting this boss or monster. Okay. That does sound cool. Matt, that does sound gross. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. But, Jaren, uh, I think the... I think that's that's all I have for uh, Monster Hunter Wilds. But the other, you know, clean game that I'm looking at, Jaren, is... Octopath Traveler 2. Not Uh-huh. I remember when the original Octopath Traveler was announced during a like a Nintendo Direct many many moons ago. Mm-hmm. And I immediately downloaded the demo. Yes. Uh so Matt, mm-hmm. I never continued my adventures with the world of Octopath Traveler. Um before you get into number 2, can you, you know, just do a recap. What is your did you play through uh, October 1? <laughs> Jaren, I did not play through Octopath Traveler 1 because I heard that game is an RPG-ass RPG. <laughs> Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And I heard that uh, Octopath Traveler 2 is, in terms of like gameplay, a much better game and much more of it of like the modern time than like, you know, PS1 SNES era RPGs. That uh, is oh, how like fair. people describe Octopath Traveler 1. Okay. Jaren, Octopath Traveler 2 is still an RPG-ass RPG. <laughs> uh, okay, Matt. Mm-hmm. So for this RPG-ass RPG, is it at least to your liking, or has it been able to hold your attention? It has been able to hold my attention. Jaren, I think the start of this game is actually quite rough for um what it is. But... I'm going to get to that in a bit because I just kind of like want to outline uh, Octopath Traveler 2 as a game first. Because Octopath Traveler 2, you know, does have your kind of standard RPG, fantasy RPG stuff, Jaren. It is your, you know, standard fantasy RPG. It takes place in a, you know, fantasy medieval time. It has like a very big cast of characters, has your magics and whatnot. And Jaren... I feel like it's been so long since I've run into a game that has random overworld encounters that it's like okay. charming again. <laughs> but Jaren, I think uh, one of the most important things that you know you have to look up when you're playing this kind of game is how many missables there are inside this game. Which Matt, you're already giving me a tummy ache. Jaren, I'm gonna take away the tummy ache because. As far as missables go, there are basically none. Like, oh, okay. Really, the only like missable thing that you would have to do a second playthrough for is that um, one of the characters you have like a choice between two things, and once you like pick one of them, you're locked out of the other one. But as far as like you know the gameplay and stuff goes, like that is the only thing that is like quote unquote missable, which is I think very very good. Well, that sounds fair, at mm-hmm. least. And I do appreciate when games do that, just mm-hmm. because I know RPGs are made to be replayed multiple times, you know, getting the things you miss, getting the endings you... The other endings, of course, but mm-hmm. I think we've said it before, Matt. It's hard to replay games, especially yes. <laughs> such a beefy RPG mm-hmm. and the JRPG variant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But what else is this game doing for you, Matt? So, Jaren, I think, like, another thing to know, going out from the start, uh, Jaren... Octopath Traveler itself is a story where, you know, a bunch of characters come together and they are kind of like doing their their thing to, to you know, 
kind of like fill out their story. And Jaren, they're I think very surprising to me. There isn't really a central story thread that links them all together. Hmm. Um, these eight characters are all Jaren. I think to be honest, like arbitrarily together, they do not have the kind of Persona Four esque. Uh, group dynamic that I was kind of hoping for in a um, RPG that is so touted for um, having strong characters. But Matt, mm-hmm. I need friendship. Yeah, Jaren, I wish there was more friendship, especially at the start. Jaren, it it has that feeling that uh, I think we've said before about like both Persona 3 and Persona 5 in comparison to Persona 4. Where instead of like, you know, a group of pals trying to solve this problem, it's a group of uh like work associates trying to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. And Jaren, I think all the characters are actually like pretty good. Um there are eight of them to start with. A very important thing to note at the start is that you have access to start as any of them, but uh the way that the kind of like storylines work is that Every character has like you know their own chapter story, and you have to like, or and, and it's like divided into multiple chapters um, that like kind of like just like kind of operate on their own. And the first character you pick, you cannot remove them from your party until you finish their whole storyline. So mm-hmm. it is kind of an important pick, Jaren. I, of course, you know was was worried about this, and I did a like you know who's best character to start with kind of like look up. Yes. And Jaren, in the kind of like article where I was, uh, you know, reading to see like, oh, yo, who's a good like starting character? They pointed out three characters, right? And kind of like off to the right in the margin, there is a poll that was uh, kind of like, oh, which character did you start Octopath Traveler 2 with? And kind of as I expected, those three characters, you know, had a significant lead over all the other characters. <laughs> okay. But Jaren, there was a fourth character. Who had was honestly past um one of the recommended characters on who to start with, and Jaren, of course, when I looked at this character, it was the like quote unquote like hot thief girl character. Of course, of course, <laughs> and I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> people like who they like. Jared, when I looked at this character, I was like, one, of course, people would start this character as this character, and two. Jaren, of all the characters in Octopath Traveler 2, I thought that if Jaren was to go into this game, this would be the character he would pick. <laughs> all right. That, uh-huh. You're making me want to check out some Octopath Traveler 2 right now. Jaren, I, I just want you to look at the like character art for Octopath Traveler 2 and look up someone named... It's spelled like Throne. That? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 And Jared, honestly, actually, she's a very good character. I'm running her in my party right now. She is legitimately, actually, a very good character. So I'm on her wiki right now. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. Seeing Thief Class, mm-hmm. uh, Path Action Day, Steal, Path Action Night, Ambush. Matt, what does that mean? Okay, so there are actually a lot of like very interesting um, things that Octopath Traveler has, or mechanics that Octopath Traveler has. Um, and one of them is called like the Path Mechanics, which means that... Um, so in the game, you are very easily able to switch between day and night. Like it is, there's literally a button for it. You press like R2 and you switch uh, from the map from day to night. And every single character has an ability that like is, they're able to use in the day and in the night. Um, for the thief character Throne, she is able to, in the morning, um, honestly, Jaren just steal from people. You walk up to them, you press the basically the uh, interact button with that person, and then you're brought to a list of uh, your target's inventory with percent chance to steal this item. If you uh, are able to succeed, you just like you know successfully steal that item. If you fail, like you'll receive like some penalty, but the it, which is called like a reputation drop. Which honestly, Jaren, you can like fix for just money. Jaren stealing from people I think makes the game too easy and I I wish I wasn't doing it so much and since it's you know what do you call it just RNG I am 
I am safe scouting on on some people who are really good. Uh, like po- like items in their pocket for me to steal from. Matt, that sounds like something. Matt, mm-hmm. for some reason, you're making me really want to play this game now. It's it's Jaren. It's it's a really it's a really like fun RPG because like for example, her like night action, which is just ambush. Jaren, sometimes people are you know blocking your way, and if you don't want to you know do a real big puzzle to solve them, solve it. You can just you can just knock them the knock them out. And uh, you, you pull them Matt. out of the way Fair. of, like, the door. Uh, Matt, I'm still on uh, Thrones or Throne's uh, wiki, mm-hmm. voiced by uh, Ray Tanaka. Uh, there's Seiyu and Erica Mendez for her English voice actor. Matt, mm-hmm. pr- pretty good voices behind her. Pretty good voices. Jeremy, I actually don't know who those people voice. Do they... Who, who, who notably do they voice? So, Matt... Uh, Ray Tanaka, you might know her from Persona 3. She played uh, Mitsuru. Oh, okay. Uh, Japanese voice actor, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. And for Erica Mendez, uh, for the English side, from Fire Emblem Three Houses, uh, Bernadetta. So, oh, true, true, true. Jenna should play Three but, Houses. I feel like that's like one of those games I want to... One of the Fire Emblems that I really want to get into just because of... The S-Links? Mm-hmm. Jared, I want I want to do some fire fire emblem esslings. Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. But uh, what else has Octopath Traveler been doing for you, Matt? So, Jared, Octopath Traveler Two combat system is a turn based RPG uh, system, and I think they do it in a very interesting way because they introduce something or they have something that's called um, I think they call it like the break system which is very similar to the kind of weakness system in Persona. Hmm. So, like, you know, you you kind of, like, every monster or enemy is uh, weak to, you know, a certain type of attack, whether, like, it's elemental, like, you know, your fire, ice, your wind, light, dark type things, or it's, like, a physical weapon, like um, staffs or swords or daggers or arrows. And everybody has kind of, like a shield value which is how many times you have to be hit with that type of attack for their shield to break and for you to stun them and put them into like a like a state where they'll take more damage and honestly at first i thought this was like a very kind of like basic sort of um mechanic to introduce into like to have like having this game but as I played further on into the game with the more kind of like, as they gained like more and more um, shield value, instead of like, you know, just taking one or two hits to break your shield, you're going to like, you know, the fives, the sevens, like that sort of thing. And the kind of addition of these shields has a very interesting effect on, I guess, the way I've been setting up my parties. Because uh, you aren't limited to four characters. And usually when I'm playing, like, you know, turn-based RPGs, I am kind of just following, you know, your standard RPG trinity, where I'm trying to, you know, find someone who can take attacks, find someone who can do damage, and finding someone who can, like, heal and support. And, you know, kind of like if... Knowing that there's a weakness system, I was kind of, like, looking more towards the persona side of making sure I have type coverage. But... Kind of having the shields there where you have to you know do a certain amount of weak hits before they're in the critical state adds a interesting fourth role where or like maybe just like another like dimension of like thinking about how you're setting up your characters where you're not only looking for type coverage you're looking for characters or ways to set up your characters that they can do multiple hits to like you know chip away at the shield uh shield number to put them into that kind of like critical state which i think is like a very nice change to have in like this kind of like weak standard i think kind of like weakness system right. that makes it like a lot more interesting to play around with okay that mm-hmm. that sounds kind of complex to me already <laughs> but if you're able if you're saying it's pretty a unique take on the genre then mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, still making me excited to mm-hmm. uh party up with uh throne or throne a mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and 
John, I think it like adds a little bit more to when you kind of look at their job system. Because yeah. Jaren, all A characters have like the a unique job. But as you play the game, you are able to get like these kind of like key items that are able to grant secondary jobs. And, you know, the secondary jobs really are kind of just like based on all the other characters where you have basically like an 80% version of their job set where you're just like missing like some big capstone feature that makes it so that, oh, you don't just like have access to everything. It's like that sort of job thing. It's, I think, a very nice system because um, the secondary jobs are not locked to the character once you assign it. It is very, very easy for you to just like switch them around, um, which allows you to kind of like experiment a lot on like who you want having a which secondary job. It's actually like very, very okay. nice. And it's really cool, man. Mm-hmm. And like the they do have a lot of. I think, like, for the main cast, they have a lot of, like, very interesting um, jobs already because they're not starting or they do have, like, you know, your standard, like, warrior, cleric, um, thief type classes. But the other classes are actually, like, Beastmaster, Apothecary, um, Scholar. I guess Scholar is normal because that's basically just a mage. But you have, like, a Merchant, a Dancer as well. Which I think are very interesting uh, job classes. That you you also get like an inventor as your secondary class for um another for, with another one of the key items. So overall, I think like the the battle system and like everything that's surrounding the battle system itself is all very very well done in Atapath Traveler, and I I really enjoy it. And Jaren, if there's one thing that I I need to warn people about for um you know getting into these fights jaren is that this game is <laughs> it's very easy to meet some welcome bears in this game jaren <laughs> okay how so, how so matt jaren uh for for the people who who have never heard the term welcome bear it is an old wow term where i can't remember what two areas it was jaren but Basically, beside a starting area, there was a very high level area in WoW, and when players would like you know cross this border without really knowing about it, yep. a usually it's just a bear comes and just kills you. And a lot of the kind of like higher level areas, um, Jared, even like a two level difference is pretty notable in this game. Um, they border a lot of like the kind of like early starting areas because right. Jaren, I'm going to go into, like, the, I think my biggest gripe against this game and a thing that made me kind of slow my progression in this game because I was kind of, like, dreading playing it um, yeah. in this way, even though I was kind of imposing this on myself, which is that, Jaren, the start of this game is actually very rough. Um, like I said earlier, you pick your character... Um, before you start the game and you kind of like play through chapter one of their story. And then you basically have full access to the map. And I think like most people, you are going to look at your world map, see what, um, I guess like quest markers you have available to you. And the quest markers are all at that point, either do the chapter two for your character, which for me was still like, seven or eight levels ahead of um what my character was at the end of chapter one. Or you do the chapter, you like go and walk to like the capital cities where the other characters are and you go do, or, and you go and recruit them. And Jaren, when you recruit them, you have the choice of doing their chapter one. Or you can kind of just like defer and do it later. And Jaren, I chose to do their chapter one because like, you know, it's an RPG. I want to go learn what these characters are doing. Fair enough. I felt like like this really slowed my progress or like enjoyment of the game because kind of like going through eight characters chapter ones back to back to back um, in a game where I, you know, when you go do the chapter one, it removes everybody else from your party and then you then you play as that character's, character's chapter one because it's playing as though, you know, you were starting as a character up until the point where you meet the character that you are actually playing as. And 
after like you know the first three i i was getting kind of like i was feeling kind of like burnt out on those but i still kept doing them because you know i want to know everybody's story and the i think like additional very unfortunate thing is that because of the way that it's written the characters until you kind of like get to um their chapter twos and something called like cross paths where um character stories interact the characters don't really interact with each other which is like i think a very very huge disappointment yeah i think with an ensemble cast like this and that's really honestly matt that's a red flag for me or the equivalent of a big turn off Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. again i don't know much about octopath traveler 2 or one for the matter but uh, with the second one, the only thing I remember from the initial release and the general reception was that these characters basically, again, we go back to the notion of Persona 4 and everyone being friends mm-hmm. and everyone kind of being there for each other, where if you're rolling deep with a party, uh, especially from these different backgrounds, these different origin points, uh, and for them not to really play off each other is mm-hmm. a huge disappointment. Uh, and especially hearing that from you as well. Um, I don't know, Matt. That's something that is a bummer. Yeah, it's very unfortunate that the game basically, you know, you get like the kind of high of starting your your selected character. And then you're immediately brought into like the drudgery of recruiting everybody else. And, mm-hmm. you know, once you get everybody it starts to feel a lot better as like you you're getting like these cross paths where like you know they're they're interacting at that point but that that like kind of like chunk between finishing your first character story and then finishing your last character's uh, initial story is is really rough jaren and i i right. wish there was like i can't really like think of a way to make it better because like they give you the option to skip it so you can just like go um do their story their chapter one at like whatever point you want, Mm -hmm. but that feels like still not a great solution in a story based game like this. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. That's rough, Matt. And Mm -hmm. I don't know how you really go about that, Mm -hmm. but like all in all, Jaren, I think that other than that, like honestly kind of like major like issue, the game itself is like very fun to play. I like the kind of like, characters themselves the the kind of like way they're doing this game games um kind of like interactions after that point and jaren the the graphical style of like octopath traveler as i think like so even good, from man. the first one so is good. like yeah if you enjoy pixel art you would you would be missing out on so much by not playing this game it it's pixel art not kind of just being your standard like you know overhead view really adds like i was so so surprised when i was exploring the environments on how well they can you know hide things behind geometry to make you know really feel like oh yeah i got the most out of this treasure or like finding this treasure or you know even the points where like they're giving you small glances at a treasure and you're like wondering oh how do i get there I mm-hmm. I think it's like so so worth kind of just like going through any of like the you know starting characters areas just to see how they're handling this kind of like 3D 2D style plane because it it is a very very unique kind of thing and I'm wondering if like like um if this is going to be how Jaren Square Enix did Dragon Quest right that was them Yes, because I'm pretty sure Square Enix also does Octopath Traveler, unless I'm like just fully losing it. But I'm wondering if this is kind of like how they are going to be doing the um like the Dragon Quest one through three remakes in terms of that like 2D HD or style or whatever they called it during uh when they were showing those off. Yeah, I believe it is 2D HD, but. Mm-hmm. I think Octopath Traveler's visual style has always been a key point for me. And I don't know, I was when it does come to more modern takes on the JRPG formula, mm-hmm. it is a style that 
if you want to have that retro aesthetic, I really hope that more people start to lift and put the resources into just because I feel like, yeah, the first time I ever saw Octobass Traveler way back, again, mentioning that Nintendo Direct just floored right away, instantly wanted to download the demo. So mm-hmm. wanting to see other game franchises lift that uh, and just to see how their original style is hopefully elevated with uh, 2D HD is something that I hope is a trend in the future. But to be honest, I'm as someone who's also not a big JRPG guy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, or at least retro JRPG guy. It's, it's hard for me to know uh, if it is still being lifted, you know, currently in 2024. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, also, I don't think I said this, like, at the top, but I am playing this through a Game Pass, so, like, if... Okay. Yeah, the game does interest you at all. Like, it is on Game Pass for uh, you to check out. Good to hear, Matt. Good to hear. Uh, any closing thoughts on Octopath Traveler 2? Uh, you know, honestly, if, like, if you have Game Pass and you like JRPGs, I think this is definitely a game worth trying. It does have an interesting system. I don't know if the <laughs> that, like, you know, multiple chapter ones thing is going to be a big, huge uh, thing for for you but if you think that uh you are kind of getting burnt out on that i would suggest kind of just like pushing the other characters that kind of chapters because um it is a little hard to keep everybody geared if you're trying to like you know do the kind of like you're going to push eight characters at once it is a lot more feasible to just like you know have a main party and then like switch out the gear um, as you use the other characters. Got him in max, Matt. Got mm-hmm, him in mm-hmm, max. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Matt, mm-hmm. that was Octopath Traveler 2. Mm-hmm. Another beefy boy episode again this week. Yes. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. still not done. Still not done. We have one more game to get through. Mm-hmm. So Matt, mm-hmm. I think you have a certain challenge up your sleeve this week. Yes. Jaren, I am bringing the Don't Match Me challenge this week. And Jaren, you know, I'm bringing you this Don't Match Me challenge for you. Because, Jaren, this is my birthday themed Don't oh, Match Me challenge. This guy, this guy, Matt Alba. Mm-hmm. What's mm-hmm. up, Matt? So, you know, you guys, as always, the game rules are always the same. I'm going to ask you five questions. You have to provide an answer that is going to be different than my answer. Uh, the. All the answers in this, um, you know, particular Don't Match Me game are going to be, or questions and answers are going to be birthday related. So, Jaren, let's start from the top. Jaren, when I think birthdays, Jaren, I think cakes. And Jaren, all I want you to do for this first question is to name a game that has a cake in it. You know, oh, oh man, it can be. You know, a a plot device. It can be an item. It can be a level, if you, if you wanted it to be. All all you need to do is make sure that that game has a cake in it. Name that game in three, two, one. Jaren, I of course got to pick the big meme portal. <laughs> Matt, uh-huh. good pick. Good pick. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh. I have to admit, when you said name a game with a cake in it, mm-hmm. that was immediately my first reaction. But mm-hmm. Matt mm-hmm. had to play it safe, and I went with Mario Party. Ooh, Jaren, the cake level is is a real standout. Yes, Jaren. The other game I was also thinking of was Mario sixty four, where you know you're you're really there just to get that cake from Peach. Plot device, Matt. Mm-hmm. Plot device. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So going on to the going over to the second question, Jaren, there is the concept of the golden birthday, the lucky birthday, the champagne birthday, which mm-hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, is the birthday where the day of the month matches your upcoming age. So yep. if you're be, if you're like, you know, born on August 18th, your champagne birthday would be your 18th birthday. So all I want you to do is to name a numerical date of the month. It's really easy. Really easy. All you got to do is basically name a number between 1 and 31. Okay. 
So, let's go in three, two, one. I have picked. I picked the number eight. So, if you picked eight, you are Gonzo. I went with 13, Matt. Mm -mm. Jern, Jern, in this case, a lucky number. Yep, lucky number. Hopefully, hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully that luck uh, that luck still runs for the next three rounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Jaren, you know, after you pick a day of the month, you you know you got to think about the month itself. And when you think about birthdays and you think about months, you of course got to link those to astrological star signs, Jaren. <laughs> of course. And Jaren, the third question, of course, is going to be name a astrological star sign a or a horoscope star sign, just a, a constellation star sign that is associated to, you know, the kind of, like, months of your birth date. So, Jaren and players, in three, two, one, I have picked Gemini. Matt? Mm hmm Had to go with my sign. Had to go with Leo there. Ooh. Was scared, though. It was... Thought you were gonna do a curve bongo Leo, so I was sweating a bit there, Matt. Jaren, no, I uh I was watching a bunch of uh Fuomoko clips before uh we did this show, so I went with Gemini. Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. Mm hmm And of course, you know, after the month comes the year and we go to the other side of the world, Jaren, where now I want you to pick a Chinese zodiac sign. It's really simple. There I believe there's only twelve of them. You just got to pick one of the uh, Chinese Zodiac signs. So, in three, two, one. Jaren, this time, I got to represent, and I picked the snake. Matt? Mm hmm I went with dragon. Ooh, the fancy snake. <laughs> <laughs> Again, sweating there, Matt. Mm -hmm. Sweating there. Mm -hmm. Matt, I thought... Oh, no, rat is one. Yeah, rat I initially is one. thought rat, but I didn't... I, I didn't know if that was an actual one, so I went with Dragon, because mm -hmm. I knew Dragon for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you pick the snake, you out. And, Jaren, the last question. The hard question, Jaren. Jaren, you know, on a birthday, you have to sing Happy Birthday to someone, Jaren. Yep. And the Happy Birthday song itself, you know, if you if you don't include the person's name, Happy Birthday his lyrics is composed of only five words. <sighs> yep. Jaren, all I want you and the players to do is pick a word from the Happy Birthday song. Any of the words that comprise, that make up the Happy Birthday song, except for the name. Okay. So, in three, two, one, I picked two. If you picked two, that's too bad. Matt, <laughs> I am unfortunately out. Damn it. Oh, man. Jaren, that's... <laughs> I should have went with happy. Matt, I should have went with happy. And guess what? I am no longer happy. <laughs> oh, man. Jaren, that's too bad. <laughs> you got me, Matt. You got me. <laughs> Jaren, <laughs> I, hold, I wrote this whole don't match me so I could do the too bad coup. <laughs> Matt, you know me too well. <laughs> Oh, uh, man. Good don't match me challenge, Matt. Mm -hmm. Good times were had all around. Another beefy boy episode. Another, Matt, celebratory mm -hmm. don't match me challenge this week as well. Where, as always, when we have to close it out, have to thank you for editing this podcast. And Matt, mm -hmm. celebrating my birthday with a don't match me challenge. Hey, thanks, Sharon. Of course, Sharon, I want to thank you, as always, for hosting this episode and, you know, Jaren kicking with me for the past pretty long uh, long episode recording. No, no worries, Matt. And thank you again. And Matt, gotta thank some more people. I uh, gotta thank Deadpool. Gotta thank Wolverine. Gotta thank uh, X-23. Cassie Nova. Uh, Matt, mm -hmm. wanna thank Tony Hawk. <laughs> wanna thank uh, our new girl Throne or Throne A. Uh, and I want to thank Matt, mm -hmm. got to thank all of those Zodiac animals, you oh, know, man. just hanging out. Mm -hmm. But Matt, mm -hmm. trying to think, 
now that your don't match me challenge is out of the way that means i'm <laughs> on the chopping block so gotta think about that this week but mm-hmm. until then matt please take it away this has been mistake zone and we're all out of good deadpool plots